Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Oda Lutz, and I'm coming to you from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I have with me today my colleague, Leslie Lowe's, and a couple of, of special guests that you'll get to meet shortly. I wanna start you off with a couple of polls, poll questions. Um, tell me what the grade levels are of the youth in your program. Uh, you can select more than one grade band there. Then um, let me know, have your youth participated in the Mission to Mars Student Challenge this summer? Um, and the answers there are, yeah, we've, we've done it, we've wrapped it up, or yes, we're in the middle, um, no, but we'll be doing it later this summer, or no, we'll be doing it in the school year, or nope, haven't done it, just curious. And any of those answers is perfectly wonderful. And then we'd like to know if any of your youth have watched any of the student talks with our NASA experts. Um, we have, uh, I think we have four, four of, the, of the student talks completed now. We have a couple more to go. Um, so let us know if you have um, been able to watch any of those either live or recorded. Um, and if you're not, if you don't know if those are, what those are, we'll uh, point you to those later. And I, I see question, yes, those chat, those, those chats are for students. This talk today is for staff. So leaders, youth leaders, um, site leaders, anyone who is leading students is what today's program is for. So if you're a student, today is probably gonna be pretty boring for you. Um, so you might wanna disconnect and check out our, our student talks. All right, we'll give you a, another minute or two here on the poll, maybe one more minute. And we will um, we'll go ahead and, and close this up in a second. If you have questions, if you would please enter those into the Q&A. Uh, my colleague Amelia is watching the Q&A for your questions, so she's not watching the chat so much as the Q&A, so please enter your questions on the Q&A and she can point you to, to the answers to your questions. So, looks like we have lots of folks with high school here. Uh, we have a few with the lower grades, wonderful. Um, we have some folks who have already wrapped up the Mission to Mars Student Challenge. Congratulations, I hope you'll be able to share with us some of your experience. And those of you in the middle, uh, thanks for taking out the time to join us in the middle of your challenge. And some who are, are doing it later this summer, great, hope you get some tips. And if you're just curious, hope you'll uh, also get some, some tips. Um, and looks like we've got some folks who've watched some of our student programs with our NASA experts, that's wonderful. Um, and if you haven't yet, or you don't know where they are, Amelia just posted in the chat a link to the um, kids sessions, the, the kids talks. So um, looks like, and sorry about that, I wasn't sharing, I ended the poll and forgot to share. So <laughs> now y'all can take a look at the poll with me. So there's your, there's your spread of, of youth and our spread of participants today. Um, what we're doing looks like got a, a nice spread and the, uh, the NASA expert talks. We just had one yesterday and that one I think went really well. And we've got another one coming up Monday. So we'll talk about that here shortly. All right, um, let's see, Leslie, we're gonna scoot on here to our next slide. Okay, so was... go ahead. Let me go ahead. <laughs> yep. For those of you who need a reminder or maybe new to um, what the challenge is all about, um, what we're hoping to do is to give you guys the opportunity to lead students in designing and building a mission to Mars um, that has, you know, not just go out there and do it, but hey, here's an education plan. Here's some activities that have been tried and tested um, and other resources from NASA that you can just take and use as you see fit in your program. And the nice thing is today, we've got some people who have done just that who can help you um, with some tips on how to um, implement it. And we'd love to hear how you've been implementing it as well. 
So um, what this consists of is a guided seven week plan that goes through all the different mission planning and, and uh, um, happening stages. Um, we've got activities from elementary, middle, high school, uh, and they're all about um, learning about Mars, planning a mission from launch to landing and exploring the surface. And as you know, since you're a part of this, um, we've got a series of one hour trainings um, that are available. Everything we've done up to this midsummer check-in has been in preparation for people to do their camps. And now we're gonna talk about how to implement these and what's gone well and uh, what challenges people might be facing in, um, in putting the, the summer camp using these activities on. And of course, we mentioned already that we've got the series of, um, of student-based um, videos too. Um, and we still have space for more. So be sure and sign up to the ones that are coming up and um, be able to enjoy that to, and ask specific questions, have your students ask specific questions um, of our experts that actually work on some of these amazing NASA missions to Mars. So today, as I mentioned, um, we are going to have a series of experts. Um, and we're so lucky to have you guys here today. We thank each one of you for being willing to share your experiences and um, the things that have worked for you and the things that may um, help implement these for different age groups, for different settings, um, just ways that real practitioners um, are act out there, you know, using this material. So we're thrilled to have them today. And I'm going to start off with um, a colleague of mine I've been working with for a number of years now, um, Gia Patafio, and she is with the Discovery Cube here in the Los Angeles area, a wonderful kids museum. And they have been doing Mission to Mars summer camps for quite a few years now using some of these activities. So they've been kind of out in front of uh, implementing that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gia now. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Leslie. I'm excited to be here. Hi, everybody. Like Leslie already introduced me. My name's Gia. I work for Discovery Cube LA and Discovery Cube LC. I'm an education manager and camp director. Um, I've been in charge of developing Space Camp in general since like 2018, and that's when Leslie and I started working together. And she's been awesome in including us in so much of the different uh, JPL curriculum that they have on their JPL education website, and we've used a whole bunch of it. I'm going to do my best to focus just on the Mission to Mars curriculum uh, that I've used, but there's so much stuff on there that you can adapt to uh, informal learning and specifically to camp. So that's what I'm going to focus on. I do have some slides that I'm going to share really quick. Boom, more for my benefit so that I don't get lost in all the things that I want to talk about. Okay, can we see the first one, Mission to Mars? Yeah, excellent, cool. So uh, the first way that we used uh, this Mission to Mars student challenge and adapted it to camp is we did a Mission to Mars camp. What makes sense, right? And this was for grades three to five originally. We've since then adapted a lot of these things for K2 as well, some older students. But specifically, our Mission to Mars camp was for grades three, five. And what we did was we used this curriculum. We kind of split this full week on-site camp into three main parts, getting to Mars, landing on Mars, and surviving on Mars. And the main things that we used in Mission to Mars camp and in a variety of other ways was the straw rockets and we used the straw rocks as kind of a introduction to stomp rockets and we did this as an individual activity and something that uh, we added and that I noticed has been added to the curriculum is trying out different shapes of fins so they added kind of an engineering design aspect um, we made targets so we could test for both accuracy did I spell that right I did accuracy and distance uh, I know in the straw rockets, the student challenge, they have them kind of measure it out. So we did a little bit of the measuring. It was more of a everybody lined up on one end of either the classroom or outside, depending OC and LA, the campuses are a little bit different. So they did this activity in different areas and they just fired their rockets. They got to try out different um, 
what are they called? Shapes of fins. They could either use some templates that we created where we used square fins or we used uh, triangle fins. They could make circular fins if they wanted to. And they tested for which shapes of fins worked in terms of accuracy, what happened when they fired off their straw rockets. And we had a discussion related to the different forces that were acting on things that fly, uh, specifically our straw rockets. So how did the way that you changed the angle, the way that you, that you fired your straw rocket, how did the different shapes of fins make a difference in gravity, lift, thrust, drag? How did the different design aspects that you added to your rocket change the way these forces acted on them. So we had that little discussion beforehand about those forces, created our rockets, tried out a couple different rockets with the different shapes of fins and different sizes and saw which ones worked best for accuracy and for distance. And it was a wide variety of different uh, results for that depending on their different star rockets. So that's one of the main things that we used in that first part of our Mission to Mars camp, getting to Mars. Our next portion was landing on Mars. And we use that parachute design activity uh, for, I think, that's, I think that's on the first day, if I remember correctly, on that Mission to Mars student challenge. And we did this in small groups. And we actually combined the parachute design activity with another activity that you can find on the JPL website, the education website, with the touchdown activity, which is um, we use a variety of supplies to make a lander. You have a little cargo that goes in there. I believe they use marshmallows for the cargo and you have to drop it from a distance and that cargo has to be safe. When we combined the parachute design with the touchdown activity and kind of an egg drop activity to make it a little bit more high risk for our campers. So what we ended up doing was we did two trials over two days because we had to spread it out so there was before the Discovery Cube actually opened. So we weren't dropping these things from the second floor and risking like people being walking underneath us. So what we did was um, we had our first day to initially build. They actually had a budget with Monopoly money. They could only get a certain amount of supplies uh, within the, to stay within their budget and to build their initial parachute lander. And the first day they tried it out without a hard boiled egg in it. We used hard boiled eggs because of messiness. Um, but the first day they tried it out without the hard boiled egg to see if they were able to at least like build the landers, see how it worked, how it dropped. And then they had a chance to go back and redesign. And then the following day they actually got that hard boiled egg. We went up to the second floor. Uh, we made sure one instructor was on top of the first floor. One instructor was on the second floor and make sure there was a nice safe drop zone. Nobody was walking beneath and they got to drop their egg. And then of course, uh, we they were actually really successful with this egg drop, probably because it was hard boiled eggs, but we didn't want that huge mess. But I think that was a really good combination of the different JPL activities. And they loved this activity so much. They wanted to, we did this in small groups of like two to three, which made it a lot easier. There wasn't too much um, back and forth between the students of what they could actually use. And they worked together really well. Each day, I believe it was about a 30 to 45 minute time to design and redesign. And then we took about 15 minutes outside to drop our different designs. And of course, uh, in this particular program and in so many of our other camps, we've used those JPL subject matter expert visits. The way that we did it for our mission to Mars camp was we uh, for this camp was the first day we had sort of this kind of thing, a webinar where our awesome JPL subject matter experts would uh, come in through, I don't think we used Zoom, we used WebEx, I think, and they would talk to us about their job, get us started on uh, what they did for different missions to Mars, what their participation was, what their job was and background was to give our students or campers kind of that initial like, whoa, this is somebody who actually works at JPL and has participated in a mission that we're kind of creating. And then they actually came back the last day and a lot of them came back in person and was a part of our showcase projects where our campers had made rovers over the whole week and they got to like see the campers presentations and they were so excited to have 
uh, those people who are like, oh, we saw them on the screen. Now we have them in person. And they got to actually like talk to them and have a Q&A with them. So that really got not only our campers, but the campers' parents were there too. And the campers' parents were just as excited to, to meet these JPL subject matter experts. So that's for our mission to Mars Camp. I'll speed through their other ones. So the art and the cosmic connection. Leslie bought the, brought this project to us and I kind of took it and roll with it and created a week-long camp, a week-long virtual camp kind of based around this art and the cosmic connection idea. And I used those different activities in the art and the cosmic connection and split them up over a variety of days. And it ended with a big project where campers could individually use any type of art uh, supplies that they had available to them. We also sent them some art supplies to create art inspired by these different pictures from that Earth and Mars matching game. So we've used this art and the cosmic connection in a week-long uh, virtual camp setting. And we've also used it, we actually adapted it for K2. So we had the same type of slides where we talk about the solar system, the elements of art and the relation to geology and pictures we see. Um, we had used that Earth and Mars picture matching game. And they took one of those pictures and just went, went crazy with it, used it as their inspiration for some type of art project. So we've used it in the virtual setting, week-long camps, three to five, K2. And we are using it this year for our on-site camps, our on-site space camp as well. The last thing I wanted to mention that we've used a lot is those scratch projects because we had some scratch programming before. Um, but to be able to combine our scratch programming and our space camp was super exciting. What a great way, what better way to combine these two different things, to get them started on understanding coding and then kind of meld that with their love and passion for space. So it's so easily adapted to virtual programming. That's where we've used it most uh, because we don't have to provide them with iPads or provide them with any type of technology. They already have that technology they're using to log into our Zoom meetings and then they can share their screen and we can collaborate all together to solve problems, to create these different scratch projects. So it was such a great thing to kind of start with a basis of scratch and then see like, hey, let's adapt these actual images of things from Mars and from Earth and throw them into our scratch projects. We even adapted it to use with iPads, which that took a couple of years to be like, wow, can we do this? We finally figured it out. And we're doing that this year on site space camps. We, are, we have a whole day dedicated to these scratch projects and using those different images. So Last, videos, videos, videos. In every single thing that we do, we include the videos that are so awesomely provided by, that are already in the curriculum or I find them on the NASA JPL website. We use the Mars in a Minute series, almost every single bit of curriculum that we use in our space camps, I throw in a Mars in a Minute. It's just a nice little one minute description of what we're gonna do and then we I love using these NASA landing animations, especially the opportunity one where we can look at the rockets, then build a rocket, and then the rover, and then build a rover, and then the lander part and build a lander. And um, that ingenuity, that the one we most recently used in both a perseverance-based camp for when perseverance was like around the time that it landed, we did a perseverance camp and we used like the real uh, footage in our uh, virtual camps and our current space camps of ingenuity that just like taking off and that's so cool. So in everything we've used so many of their videos in all of our curriculum in space camps and our virtual camps. So that is all I have. I think, oh look at that timing, bam. So that is all that I have for all of the how I've adapted it to camp and it's been so awesome using all this JPL information and activities that they have on the education website. So that's how we've adapted it. Yeah. Okay. Thank that's you all so I've much. Got. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dia. It's amazing what you have done. Um, and um, we're just thrilled that, you know, something like this is being able to brought to the kids and that you have such talent to be able to take it and, and make it a fun experience for the kids. We're just so lucky. I have one question and then we can see, I know you have to go here very quickly to start your camp. So, uh, <laughs> so I just have one question that I wanted to ask and then we can see if there's other questions in there. Amelia can let us know. Um, when you were doing the egg drop activity and um, 
what were the safety considerations that you used? Um, you know, since you did have the kids, you know, up above ground level, how did you keep the kids safe? And as you said, the people safe around there. Classroom management, so much classroom management. So what we did was before we even left our camp room, uh, we set our expectations of we are going to be doing something. We are going to be dropping something off of our second floor. That means the entire time that we are moving through the museum and we are waiting for our turn, we're going to be staying. We have like an orange wall that we line kids up against. So like you have to stay like touching this orange wall in your groups. And we would have one instructor, and usually we have like a volunteer or two, one instructor on top who was managing those kids who were getting ready for their drop. And as soon as they had dropped their lander, they would walk down like our ramp that we have. And I believe that in OC they have, um, I believe they also, they dropped it, I think from the third floor because they have more floors than we do. And so the, as soon as they would drop, they would, as a group walk down those stairs or walk down our ramp, retrieve it. And the instructor down there had a special spot where they would go and sit and talk and collaborate and open up and see if their egg survived for the second trial. And then we'd wait until the bottom instructor was like, okay, everything is clear. And a big part of it was doing this before the discovery cube opened because Summer can be crazy, but we did this before it opened so we didn't have to worry about kids running through as we were dropping something. Uh, so setting expectations and just keeping them in spots and doing this before the Discovery Cube opened. That's how we handled it. And we didn't have any issues. The instructor did a great job of keeping everybody safe for this. Great, great. I know you've just got a couple of minutes. Amelia, uh, do we have one question we can ask to you? Um, the questions that have come in have been more general. Okay. All right, well, with that, we should let you go. Um, so you can get started, but we sure appreciate you being on. Thank you, Gia. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I'll see you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, and so the way we've organized today's speakers were kind of in uh, geographical distance from us in Pasadena, California. Our next guest is uh, Tish Brzee. Tish is uh, one of our NASA solar system ambassadors. I think, gosh, Tish, we go back like a decade or something, uh, might more than that probably. It seems like I've known you forever, um, even though we've never physically met in person. But I, I know Tish does a lot of great work. Uh, Tish works at the Copernic Observatory in Vestal, New York, and uh, is quite the experienced educator. Um, Tish, take it away. Tell us what, what you know. Thanks a lot, Oda. You know, uh, if it wasn't for the JPL being so friendly, we have so much more to offer our kids uh, thanks to our, our partnership with you guys. Thank you so much. I'm working from home today, as you can probably see. Um, but we have camp running at Copernic right now. And uh, we've been trying out a couple of things. I'm a, a Mars enthusiast overall. And so I have tons of things that have to do with Mars. Um, by the way, I do want the JPL people to know that we're still waiting to see when we can borrow um, the models and things like that that we, we love to have for the summer and the fall. Okay, we'll get to that later. Um, I just have two things to show. Uh, Copernic has been experimenting with, um, uh, by the way, all you high school teachers, it's always an experiment. You do it over and over and over again and it's changing every time, but it keeps getting better. So anyway, one was the uh, presentation for, let me get that up, for the Mars mission um, planning. And well, I, I don't need to put that up. That's Elio Murillo did um, planning a mission to Mars. Uh, he spoke with our kids uh, last, two weeks ago and um, wonderful, wonderful images and PowerPoint presentation, and the kids loved it. Um, I would, though, recommend high school and middle school for that more often than 
my kids were grades four and five and they they got a lot out of it but even more from middle and high school so you should definitely get the engineer from jpl to elio marillo uh to talk about mars all right that's planning a mission um it was very helpful a very helpful background um but uh the one thing that i want to present here is the mars bound game game board and when um, we were first exposed to Marsbound two years ago, we thought it was a great idea for a game, but we couldn't afford to print up all the stuff and make cards and all that stuff. So when you made this uh, PowerPoint, or someone did, uh, we just jumped on it. So I'm gonna share that first. Let's see if it's coming up. Not, did it come? We only see the top of your uh, screen. Oh, yeah. Can you see that? There it is. Oh, okay. This is the page uh, for all of you people who haven't tried this yet or are thinking about it. This is a page from the PowerPoint where uh, Oda somehow got this uh, made into a game that can be used either online or in class or simply without a board at all. And we love it. Um, I ended up copying all the cards in black and white and printing them up on sturdy white paper or just paper cards. But the students in my class, uh, grades four and five, used this game, had a lot of fun with it but it was really serious. You're talking about serious decisions they had to make. Uh, otherwise you roll the dice at the end, sometimes your engine blows up. So anyway, um, you have to keep track of all these different um, parts of the mission. Let me share this other piece. This is the Mars bound um, log, which is a spreadsheet, just a moment. Can I do stop there? and start there. Okay, I think that's the one I want. Okay. No, that's not the one. Okay. This one. I've got two of them. I think you can see this one. Yep, that's perfect. All right, this is a this is a modified log sheet. Just to let you know that we use the same budget. Um, if you're not familiar with Marsbound game, I just want you to know it's got so much to offer. Um, you have your team has to decide on materials that you're going to take on your trip, and within a 250 million dollar budget and uh, a mass limit, a power limit, and you hopefully get some science return from it. And then at the end, it's kind of a contest to see who's got the most science for the most money, or for the least money, I should say. So uh, we love this. Um, I want you to know that the fourth and fifth graders did it together. And I helped them go step by step. For example, um, let me show you that. I wonder if this is going to let me do the other page again. Yeah. All right, can you see the Mars bound board? No, you can't. Okay, I'm gonna just do that again. Going back to the Mars bound board. Yep, we got it. Okay. Um, I think uh, grades maybe three, four, five, six should do this together step by step. You see these red cards, one through six. We offer them a choice of engines and nose cones. And then they go to step two, which is the, the, the power uh, options. And then you go to step three and so on. And that way, if you do it together as a team, um, they need teacher guidance mostly, I would say. That's my guess. Um, in our camps, we are pretty serious about our science and I just love Mars. So I wanna make sure that they get the most out of this. 
Um, so it's really a blast. Uh, they really have some true decisions to make. And this combined with Elio's talk about planning a mission turned out to be perfect. So that's, that's about it. I just wanna um, do a, a final moment if I could. Let me see, did I lose it? There you go. Um, I wanna say that we've had two, three weeks of camp so far. And last year, that virtual year at home has been a total change of the kids. The kids are having trouble associating with other people and also um, understanding their own feelings. I guess when they're at home, you know, they could just mute themselves and go off and play. But here, face to face, they have to get used to being face to face again. So I want all the teachers out there to think about how can you um, make it more personal, as personal as you can feel comfortable with, to let these kids uh, feel the one-on-one uh, -on -one again. Um, it's something they truly miss and need lots of practice with. Okay, um, that's just about it. Um, did I hit the topic that you were hoping for, Oda? I was hoping for your real life experience and it sounds like you yeah. you had some good experience here. The, yeah. the online Mars game was developed, I mean, the Mars Bound was developed at, um, at Arizona State University and we, we had the print version as you mentioned for a long time. And then one of our educators during the, the COVID pandemic this last year, one of our, our high school educators in Los Angeles developed the online version, which we have wanted forever. And yeah. Um, so I'm really glad you're able to use it. Were you using the online version in person or uh, remotely? Yeah, actually, we used the PowerPoint because it was set up step by step. Like I mentioned, you, you just have to choose these first and then we'll go to part two. And I have a feeling that the engineers did it kind of the same way. They had their little meetings, you know, and then you get to the bigger meeting and the bigger meeting and the whole package has to be less than 250, you know? So um, that that's a team within a team and uh, that's complex, but uh, it's reality, you know? That's the way it goes. So I'm hoping that the kids um, get a feel for what it's like to be an engineer in the full, full meeting type. Okay, do you think yeah. that we got it? Did we get yeah, it? that's that's perfect. Okay. Thank you. I, the Marsbound right. game was was modeled after how we actually design missions at JPL, mm -hmm. and and you're right. Um, uh, Ilio's talk went directly with this. This if if you are watching today and you uh, are still a little bit more curious about the Marsbound game during our professional development for the section called Plan Your Mission, we went through this game in detail. Uh, and you can find that recording on the JPL Education YouTube channel or on, it's also linked from the uh, Museum and Informal Alliance page for the challenge. Um, and then also Ilio's talk that goes with this is recorded as well. It's also linked from the Museum and Informal Alliance page. Leslie? I think it's Hi. definitely built for middle and high school students, mm -hmm. especially. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna ask you, Tish, um, over what time period did you do the game? How long did you need oh, to you never have enough up? How long did you them. need to explain <laughs> it? You know, how many, how much time did it take for the kids to actually do it? Well, they played the game after they listened to Elio. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we did several other Mars activities, but um, let's see, they built a rocket in between. So they did some other steps. Um, yeah, there are several other activities that we did in between, but mm -hmm. I tried, I really could have used a lot more time. Um, mm -hmm. I did it in about two hours in the okay. afternoon. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. With a little time to discuss what it's all about and then for them to make decisions and then to wrap it up again. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it all seems right. like we could always use more time, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes by very quickly, except when you want it to be. Yes. 
<laughs> I hear you. I yeah. hear you. Okay. Right. So well, thanks a lot for having me. We'll see you later. Yeah. Thank you, Tish. Really appreciate your time and uh, sharing your, your experience with us. All right, our next presenter is coming to us all the way from Ireland. Um, now, I did not um, know this person, Francis McCarthy, until the Mission to Mars Challenge, and I have come to learn that Francis is quite the uh, experienced and creative educator, and I'm really excited to have her share with us today. Francis teaches or is an educator at the uh, Black Rock Observatory in uh, in Ireland. And uh, Francis, when I looked up your your facility, I was like, "Really, Black Rock Castle is a castle?" It okay. is. It's That's seriously cool. a castle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, take it away. Tell us. Uh, tell us what yeah. you have to share. Super. So I'll just share so you get a little sense of where. I'm literally coming from. I'm, I'm currently working from home, but this is where I work. So hopefully you have a picture of my, personally, my personal castle, okay? So when we say I work at Black Rock Castle Observatory, there is physically a castle in a place called Black Rock, which is in Cork City, which is right on the south coast of Ireland. The observatory part is a telescope, which is up on the top of the roof. So on this image at the very top, you should be able to see a little dome. And that dome is our telescope. So it's maybe not the best place in the world to have a telescope at sea level in Ireland, where it is often a little bit cloudy, but our observing staff live in Ireland. And so we can test out systems in our observatory and then put them in robotically operated telescopes around the world. So we have a reason for it. Um, and we, the castle itself uh, is right on the River Lee. So it's right in the center of that star. So we got a shout out from Shane Kimbra aboard the space station just last week saying great memories of being in Cork. He came and launched rockets with us back in 2011. All right, in person he came and we launched rockets from the car park next to our castle up into space. So this is where we are on the banks of the River Lee, right in the south coast of Ireland. So other cities you've heard of, none of them compare to Cork. All right, I've been in Cork 21 years and I love it. Irish citizen now, even though you might tell from my accent that I'm originally not from Ireland. I, I'm English and I grew up in Canada. So a little bit of both. And this is our 400 year old castle. Uh, it's burnt down twice. We're trying to avoid burning it down a third time. But the uh, the oldest part of it, what we call our dungeon, is 400 years old. And it's the level right at the bottom, the called the dungeon. And up on the top is where we have the telescope. So we have a visitor center. We work with uh, students of all ages. And we run summer camp. Well, this year is going to be a virtual summer camp. But we've been running a summer camp for years. Um, I think I started in 2008. I started the observatory in 2007. And I think I took the first summer to get my bearings and then we started the camp the following year. And we work with all sorts of people of all sorts of ages um, and coordinate Space Week in Ireland, which is a national STEM week that we reach out for both formal and informal organizations. So we have lots of activities and lots of guidance for people to take space as a theme and to act with it. So specifically with these activities, so I rocked up to this going, oh, you know, this looks kind of interesting. And what did the first one I remember being at? <gasps> oh my God, I love it. Complete love. Oh, the cosmic connection, the art, okay? So just a little background, we've been making what we call deadly moons, an Irish expression. If something is really good, it's deadly. Deadly, miss, deadly. So uh, an artist, uh, Deirdre Callaghan, um, uh, uh, developed a kind of activity that was art and sketching with pastels. And we used the moons of the solar system and made an art activity around them. And so here we are, this is in 2000 and nine. I think it's 2009. I, I looked up the year 2009, 2010. So all those kids are now 
10 years older, 12 years older. It's kind of scary to think that. With the art and the cosmic connection, because I work with children from age four up, so it's not even kindergarten age, because um, you start school in Ireland here at junior infants, the year in which you turn five. So I will be working with four-year-olds and five-year-olds. So simplify the language. The art and the cosmic connection has fabulous stuff. The art and the connection to the geology of the planetary surface, brilliant science meets art. It's great and it can be simplified. Um, so I created a summary sheet. So take the little icons that, that come with the activity. So the blobs and the circles and the volcanoes, and I've got a summary sheet. Uh, reading age on it is, is still about grade five. Um, I couldn't make it too much simpler and still have it useful, but with support from a facilitator, a younger child who may not be reading fluently at least has the little bit of a support to access it. We're still working remotely. Um, Ireland being on the edge of Europe still has influences beyond Ireland for, for our COVID situation. So we are, we're still working remotely. So I know that a child is not gonna rock up on a computer without a parent somewhere nearby. So I've got that backup for language support with a parent. So I don't, I, I've created a little bit of extra to it. Um, I don't, I don't wanna, you know, bite the hand that gave me all this, but in Europe, we're emphasizing a lot of the European space agency that nobody's ever heard of, okay? So I, yes, I'm interested in Mars, but I'm also referencing Titan and the European space agency lander that went well, piggybacked with a NASA mission. We'll give Cassini that, okay? But Huygens landing on Titan. So we're emphasizing a little bit of our European connection. So I took Mars and, you know, add a little bit more. Um, so, ju but just look at these kids. They've created something beautiful. In this case, uh, mostly the moon Enceladus. They were fascinated with Enceladus. And we've continued both the art and the drawing and the activities with literally all ages of children for years. And it's a winner. If you're not doing it, you need to do it. Everybody will value it, okay? Um, the plan your mission, this is the, the activity of the, the, the board game. The guidance, lads, lads, this is in the cork sense of the word lads. It means everybody, both male and female, it's the equivalent of guys. Guys, you say 40 minutes. Where did you get 40 minutes from? Seriously, where did the 40 minutes come from? This is, I, uh, Tish said it, it's a couple of hours a couple of hours of fabulous engagement. It's a couple of hours for those uh, young people who like card games, who like reading the cards and finding the numbers and gaming that system the best they can to win. I could see this as a solitaire activity. I could see this small groups. So I'm intending to use it. We have um, uh, a link up to a, a NASA rocket scientist, which we're delighted with in August. So we're getting our Space Camp alumni back for virtual sessions building up to this. And we're gonna do this in a virtual environment, but we're gonna split into breakout rooms with a facilitator. I'm gonna get onto Tish and get that spreadsheet because I can remember when we play, you played it with us. Um, I think Leslie, you were busy adding numbers in the background really fast. So I like the idea of a spreadsheet already ready to go for me. Or next year when we're back face to face, one game per table and table compete against table. So, but seriously, 40 minutes. Allow more time. Use those Google slides for reference. Have all that reference. You don't need to print it out. And it's brilliant. Love it. Love it. Love it and the design your spacecraft, okay? Um, this is, I found this picture in my files, okay? This is 2009 when we made uh, not the current Mars rover, but a previous Mars rover. And at that point, we were just looking to get the shape and not particularly the functionality. So with our designing our rover and our activity, be really clear on the task. The wheels have got to move. I know we created um, a version that was very simplified. 
I think the opportunity here for expanding it is great, but the wheels have got to move. Or else, I've done this before with, with groups, you get the most beautiful space buggies that just don't move, which might be what they wanted. It is what they wanted, it's what they made. Double check your elastic bands. Uh, hopefully you can see me as well as my screen. So in the version I made, and you know, it's beautiful. Actually, I'll stop sharing so you can, you can see me a little bit more clearly. Okay, uh, in the version I've made, if you use a rubber band that looks like this, it goes nowhere, okay? The, the force, the elastic force that's required for a thick rubber band is impossible for this activity, okay? I remade it with a really skinny, thin elastic. Oh my goodness, it's so much happier, okay? So this is the type of stuff you can buy from a haberdashery or a fabric shop. It's the very thin, very relaxed elastic. And it works brilliantly, okay? Make sure your wheels stay solid. The amount of tape you will use for this is beyond what you would normally allow for an activity, but you need it, okay? Because this works really well. Um, I have had success using milk bottle cartons. Here, milk bottle comes in two or three liter plastic cartons. It's a great recycled use for milk cartons, but um, this kind of rigid corrugated cardboard is also useful because you can hold it and still be able to get at it with a very simple way like that. So uh, that's, you know, one little bit of recommendation for that particular activity. Check your elastic bands, check those rubber bands, throw away the ones that look like this and get the really lightweight ones. And then you, you and your students will have a lot of fun. And my final kind of comment, um, again, I don't need to share a screen on this one. Um, the final activity that I'm intending to do with um, our young people is the sample handling activity, which Gia mentioned about using Scratch. And with that, my guidance is consider who your audience is and who, who is benefiting from that activity. In this particular case, it's me because I know nothing about Scratch. I am having to learn Scratch to do this with my young people. And if I'm not learning something from an activity, there is an opportunity lost. There's an opportunity to enrich my professional practice by stretching myself beyond what my comfort zone is. I wrote one bit of code for my undergraduate degree in BASIC in 1985. And I said to Oda and Leslie before we started, when I was in high school, the coders had punch cards. Coding is a foreign new world for me. And the opportunity to let the students I work with teach me enhances what's going on for both of us. So for you who are like, oh, I have to have the best camp in the world. Well, you do, but part of what makes it the best in the world is engaging those children to work with you and support you in what you're doing, and you both benefit from it, okay? And that's coming from a lot of years of doing space camp. Learn from the kids. And I hate to tell you this, but we used to drop our eggs off the roof for the castle. That's Five awesome. floors up. <laughs> Five floors up. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, Francis, thank you so much for your, your wisdom and your tips. Um, and I hear you and I heard Tish about the 40 minute thing. We will adjust our time. I can go in and edit that today and I will do that because that I, I hear you. The 40 minutes is kind of like the bare minimum if you're busting through it in a hurry, but yeah, to do it well. Yeah, a long, lot longer. And the yeah, you're right about the um, the elastic bands. Uh, and we kind of leave that as a bit of a mystery for folks to do their own exploration because we do want to, we want to encourage exactly what you said is uh, is exploring with the students. We don't want you to have all the answers because it's really valuable for students to understand that we adults are learning with them. Yes. Uh, because the world but changes. Be, yeah. but. When it comes to your first time making it, make sure you have a bunch of different elastic bands because some of them just are not going to be any good. 
Yep. Yep. That is definitely the truth. Now, uh, I, I love all of the, the adaptations and, and such that you have done. Um, what to you is the most challenging part of, of doing these activities, the, the Mars activities with the kids? Do you know, I love the fact that they can be as open-ended as you have time for. And occasionally you will have young people who are going off over there. And you got to make a decision. Do you just watch them disappear off into the distance with the activity? Or do you try at least keep everybody on the same page? It's, they're appealing. They're so well resourced and easy to access that, that there aren't particularly too many challenges with them. It's, it's the nature of the group on the day, which will see how successful it goes. And, you know, that's one of the things that you just with experience, you can kind of see when the kid is heading way off, way off. And how do you gently bring them back? And how do you make sure they have a successful experience? You know, you want things challenging, but not too hard. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the, the fun. Challenge. Yeah. That's part of the fun. And in, in my experience is, is, you know, giving those kids that opportunity to go off a little bit and do their own exploration. It gives them that sense of agency about their own learning. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Although being aware that for a lot of young people, the question will be, have I done it right? Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I got to say, I, I can't stand that question because that implies there is a right that they're aiming at. And I've always turned it around to, is it working? Is it doing what you want it to do? Then you've done it right. Right. And that's, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that we try to encourage is there's not just one right answer. Yeah or just one right way to get to an answer. There are multiple ways to get to answers. And mm -hmm. um, I'm really glad you brought up the, the European Space Agency because uh, NASA has wonderful partnerships with the European mm -hmm. Space Agency and the, the Huygens probe on Cassini, the fact that we landed a probe on Titan, look how much we learned at, at, in that partnership and international partnerships are so important. Um, yes. scientists all over the world collaborate on exploration mm -hmm. and finding solutions to problems. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can contribute to science and to space exploration if you so desire. Yes. Yeah, um, and, and the layering of, of ESA and JAXA and the Canadian Space Agency and NASA together, all those Mars missions ESA have a Mars mission. It's in orbit. Mars Express is still working just fine after, is it 12, 12 years old? It, it's a, over 10 years old. And yeah, it's great, around. you know? Yeah. So those layerings yeah. is great. And, the, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to get to space aboard an Ariane 5. Right. ESA rocket. Yes, 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 exactly. So the, these international collaborations are wonderful. Um, the, the country of India has spacecraft around Mars. Uh, there are, so I know we have a lot of, of folks from India watching today and, and we think that those accomplishments are amazing. Um, they got to Mars on their first try. Like, wow, who does that? That's crazy or cool. Nobody um, does that. Nobody right? gets to Mars. On first <laughs> yeah, so it's so something to be proud of for sure. And so we, we do love to celebrate the international collaborations and accomplishments of other countries. Leslie, you had a question? I want to, that's a perfect theme for me because I did want to ask Frances, you know, how she balances um, individual work with the kids, you know, where they do their create and how you have them work in a team. You know, what, how do you set things up to, yeah. to give um, kids both opportunities? I got, I, I find, you know, for here, for summer camps, when we're face to face, it's the, the cohort that we have coming to us have chosen our activity because of what we offer. We're not throwing 500 children into a field for sports activities for the full day. And they and their parents value that opportunity to work independently. So it means that I set up large tables, but if you wanna work on your own for this activity, rock on. We have large space, shared materials as much as possible, um, sanitized when required. 
And that allows people to, to self choose, you know, for a particular activity. We are encouraging, I, I bear in mind our last speaker saying, you know, children will need some opportunities to socialize and work together again, particularly if they've had an environment where they've been working so independently. Um, Irish schools have stayed open for most of the pandemic. Um, two closure periods, uh, spring last year and after Christmas this year until um, nearly Easter, not quite Easter, but a little bit after Patrick's Day. So we had extended periods of closure and it's been very difficult depending on so many aspects of, of that engagement with the formal education system. So I'm, I'm not trying to reproduce formal education. We are really emphasizing those social skills but some children need that little, they need that personal space. They need that own agency to act in a way that will make them feel positive and succeed. And maybe the next activity, they'll work with somebody else and we might pair them up and say for this one, you know, we're gonna use the two brains and maybe a later activity we might go to three. But I think, you know, children will let you know what they're comfortable with and you need to listen to it. Yeah, I think that's really important, um, especially as you mentioned during these times of transition and um, yes. students coming from a variety of different places of learning. Um, and I think that our, our summer camp programs really have an opportunity to help get those kids socialized mm -hmm. again and, and, and ready for the formal classroom in the fall. So um, I think that, that uh, all of our, our summer programs and our after-school programs do such an enormous service to our students outside of the formal classroom in helping with those, those social skills and, and learning and a little more free time to learn in their own way. I, I really appreciate the work of our, of our summer and after-school program staff. It's really, really important. Thank you for your uh, work with the students, and we really appreciate your contributions today. Uh, we look forward to, to hearing more from you as you uh, do your August counts. <laughs> we know you have some coming up. So thank you. I uh, want to go back to a couple more slides here to close us out. I want to remind everyone that we have a student showcase. So if you have students who are doing these projects at home or at your camps, you can submit their, their work. If, uh, if you're a parent or, or an educator, either way, you can uh, submit student work and we'd love to see what they are doing. We're getting stuff from all over the world and we, we just love to see student work. Um, we, were, we also want to hear what about what your kids appreciate most in the uh, in the challenge. So uh, feel free to pop those comments into the chat or uh, send them to us on the on the student showcase. Either way, um, and uh, if you have not already joined the Museum and Informal Education Alliance, uh, Amelia is our our Museum and Informal Education Alliance guru. Amelia, what can you tell us? Yeah, thank you, Oda. Uh, well, the first thing to say that this is for informal educators. So this is students. I know we have some of you on the line. This, this is something else that's not for you guys. So informal educators, people working in museums, science centers, camps. Um, like everything NASA does, this is free. So you can see the link there. We, we encourage you to join up. That'll put you into a community of practice with other informal educators. And we will be keeping you up to date, making sure you have the resources, um, because we know that informal education is a, a special um, category that maybe needs sort of specialized material. So we're glad to help preside that. Um, I think it says there, we have regular briefings by NASA experts. Um, upcoming this month on July 22nd, for example, we will be having a special presentation for you educators um, about the Mars Ingenuity helicopter. So that's a good one to get the latest scoop on. And then also, you know, we do trainings like this. If there's if there's certain types of trainings that you want on certain things, um, certain activities, uh, just let us know. Myself and Jeff Nee run it, and we'd be glad to get your feedback on what you want to learn about. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Amelia. Appreciate that. I'm a big fan of the Museum and Informal Education Alliance. I, I use it for my own professional development and uh, refer all of my educator colleagues to, to that as well. So uh, if you're an educator, um, an adult staff member, feel free to, to join us. 
And with that, I'll leave you with the link to the challenge, go.nasa.gov slash Mars dash challenge. Uh, you can do the Mars challenge anytime, anywhere, uh, use as little or as much of it as you wish. And we hope that you will find it useful and, um, and engaging for your students. So thanks again for joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Have a great summer.